Well, first of all, I can tell you a little bit about Jan. I only met him a month ago um, after reading Andre Dorator's book and seeing, and you are the star other character in that book. Uh, it's Andre, talks about Andre, and for sure, but he talks a lot about you as well. And then I was asked uh, at Fine Arts every year here in Hermanus, there's a Fine Arts uh, gathering where there's a lots of lots of different discussions on a wide variety of subjects, and I don't think you could make the fan, fine arts fan art. But a week after fine arts, we were here in this in this auditorium, and uh, we had a conversation uh, where I met you for the first time, and yeah. it's, it really was a privilege. Unfortunately, my recording equipment doesn't work as well as John's recording equipment. So it was very difficult to decipher everything we said that night, but uh, we we did do our best and many people were very, very interested in the inside story on load shedding. Jan is the former chief operating officer of Eskom until very recently, as I said right in the beginning this morning, uh, he was on a two-year contract with Eskom after a quarter century of service, but he's left. And of course, we thought this was the reason for it. ChatGPT didn't tell me anything about that, but they did say, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure I introduce Mr. Jan Oberholzer, the former COO of Eskom. I had to put in former because they're a bit behind the times. They still called you in that job. South Africa's principal electricity supplier. With a career defined by strategic leadership and innovative thinking, Jan continues to navigate the intricate complexities of our energy sector. His profound expertise and steadfast commitment are integral to our National Power Initiative. As we anticipate his enlightening discourse today, let's extend a warm welcome to Mr. Jan Oberholzer. You know, I I just love this this uh, AI or chat GPT because if I said that, people would say, oh, I'm sucking up, you know, it's just, uh, but but chat GPT knows all, AI knows all, and they, they, they scan the whole internet and come with these really, um, I think, uh, very flattering descriptions of you. But when we sat here that, that night four weeks ago, you said, my blood is blue, my blood is blue, because I'm an Eskimoite. Now, there weren't many people in this audience who were there that night. Just explain why you are an Eskimoite in your, the 50 years of history, really, in your family. Thanks, Alec. Um, you know, my dad used to work for Eskom for 20, 25 years. So it wasn't an Eskom house, but I grew up in an Eskom house. And uh, my dad was not, uh, you know, a... Uh, wearing a tie, he was uh, building these rural lines, you know, these wooden piles, uh, poles, lines in, in the rural areas. And I can remember when I was a young boy, and on weekends and sometimes school holidays, I uh, I joined him. Go and have a look what, he, what he's basically doing. So that was for quite some time in my life. Then I became an ace conversion. And at the time, the bursary was given to him and wasn't given to me uh, because of his year's service at the time. And so I studied for a long time because rugby was more important than studies uh, for the first couple of years. Um, but then I started, and then also, you know, at the time while you were studying, you did VAC work also at Eskom. And... Um, then I worked for Eskom for 26 years, going through the ranks. Um, it's always been a an irritation to me lately, because the way that I learned, you know, the the electricity sector was by by doing things yourself and going through the ranks, and only you get an, another step when you've mastered what you have been doing. And I've always been saying, and especially lately, how do you get 20 years of experience? You've got to stop and work for 20 years, you know, and you need a, a coach and a mentor to help you. However, that was for 26 years. Then something happened. 
and I decided to have a look if the grass is really green outside there. So I became a contractor and the CEO of the company after some time he said to me, Jan, you're not actually a contractor. I said, no, I'm not. That was in the time of the 2010 World Cup, so you understand why I wasn't a, a contractor. Um, because ethical value, my value of uh, ethical behavior is critical, and I'm not saying you know all contractors are, are not uh, ethical, but some of them definitely not. Then I decided to, to leave the contracting world. I then spent two years in Zambia and Lusaka, while the family was back home, quite nice. I really enjoyed it. Then I came home, um, spent some time with a, a company. Then I was approached by one of the board members to ask if I will be interested. That was in 2018 to, to join ESCOM again. I said yes, so I went through a, a recruitment process and I was given the tick. So the last five years... Up until the end of April, was the group chief operating officer. Um, then I was asked to stay behind for two two more years, which I initially said no. I agreed then. And then about two weeks ago, I decided, you know, to do something else. So in a nutshell, that is why the blood is blue. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Four weeks ago, you were committed. I was saying to people, don't worry, load shedding's going to end. Jan Oberholtz is there. He's looking after this. He's looking after that very impressive guy. And then they all looked at me two weeks later and said, what? I'm sure this is why you invited me today. <laughs> because everybody's tried to ask me that question. I've said no to all the interviews. Um, there are a couple of reasons, um, Alec. The most important one, I believe, is... I believe I can add more value with my experience and my competence and I believe my knowledge of South Africa, the industry, the electricity industry outside Eskom. I believe that Eskom, although it's going through some very tough times um, and specifically in generation environment, that, you know, because of load shedding, that's on everybody's mind. Um, the plans that we have put in place, I would guess over the last few years, are the right ones. I believe that should ESCOM follow this generation department, uh, the region, those plans diligently and they really work hard, that will make a significant improvement, make no mistake. Um, the board, the, the new board, appointed end of last year, you know, they created a subcommittee called uh, the Board Operations uh, Performance Committee. I believe the oversight is there now to really implement those plans. Um, then if you take my role as a consultant, it's hell of a difficult, you know, for five years telling people what to do. And if they don't do it, then you motivate them how to do it. And then all of a sudden, you know, to change, to, to give advice, to tell them, please, I believe you should do it this way, didn't work for me. It really didn't work. So I, I really believe that it is time for me now to um, you know, outside Eskin. Um, so there's no bad, bad blood between Eskin and myself. Not at all. Uh, I respect the people in Eskom. I respect my colleagues. Whenever they believe that they need to pick up the phone and ask some advice, it will be there. It will always be there. But I believe the value that I can add now will be outside Eskom. So when you spoke to uh, Caleb Trichalia, the shadow minister, you were telling the truth. Yes, I was. <laughs> yes, I was. Do you lie? Do you lie much? Ask my wife. No, I mean, no. Actually, no, you know, I try to be as open and honest as possible, even if it's painful for whoever's on the other side. I like people to understand who I am, and I don't like talking behind people's back. 
maybe that's one of the reasons why I haven't been that popular talking to people about poor performance. Uh, I will call somebody in or I'll go and see the person team and I'll make it very clear what is expected and what is, uh, and you know, like what people perhaps don't understand, um, you're working for Eskom. If you work for Eskom, you know, you, you're a servant. You're a servant to the country. And if you don't want to be a servant, you know, go and open something else, you know, do something else. But if you work for Eskom, if you put your head on the pillow that evening, you either have or you have not contributed positively to a to the to the lives of six million people. Seriously, um, my job and 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 the role that Eskom fulfills in this country, you know, the economy and, the, and to better the lives of people. And and this is what you need to understand. If you work for Eskom, you've got to serve the people of the country. That's a very good point, and one that I never understood until I. Uh, personally worked for the SABC for after my Deborah was let out of jail. Up to that point, it was a bit of a dodgy place to go to. But once he was let out of jail, it legitimized. And it was a, it was a national broadcaster, not a politically driven broadcaster. And I worked there for three years and loved every minute of it because you were in service. And quite often people who've never worked for the state or in any public sector don't understand that. They think there's something else that motivates. But electricity was the second industrial revolution. We're in number four. But electricity is erratic in South Africa. Mm. When are we going to get to a point where it's no longer going to be erratic? And, and how? Mm. Ella, the first time we had stage six load shedding was the 9th of December, 2019. I don't even can remember that. Because load shedding today, you know, people don't even talk about it. Uh, that's so irritating. Um, but that happened on the 9th of December, 2019. The state president at the time was in Egypt and he returned to South Africa and I had to face him on the 11th, two days later. It was him, the Deputy President Mabuza, the Minister of Minerals and Energy, Mantasha, and then our own Minister at the time um, of Public Enterprises, Gordon. I had to face them and explain to them why. Um, and that's when I started using the analogy, you know, the example of a car. If you've got an old car, because if you take Eskom's power stations, you know, the coal-fired power plant, on average, is 44 years old if you take the Medupi and Kusili out of the equation. And they've got some challenges as well. Eh? Not if you read what Coco is saying, but believe me, they have some challenges. Um, so if you've got old cars and you don't maintain them, and all you do is you put in fuel, you put in water, and you put in some air if the tires need. And whenever you get in the car, the foot's on the accelerator all the time, flat. So utilization is, is, is way where it's not supposed to be. Um, then you're going to start picking up some, 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 some challenges. As I was explaining this to the audit and say where we find ourselves, um, and I think I've perhaps done a good job. And then over and above that, you know, with the policies in the country is if that car breaks down, you know, you don't take it to the manufacturer's car. You take the anti-blade back out the cake. And then you don't use a qualified mechanic, you use anyone. Because these are the polished. Some still. And then if you want to put in spare parts, you don't put in the manufacturer, you know, what has been prescribed for this car, any second hand part, whatever, or pirate part. So I was explaining this and afterwards, you know, Deputy President Mabuza was saying, Jan, so what are you saying to us? Actually, we need lots more new cars. And I thought well, that was great. He's understanding what I'm saying. Because it's exactly what we need. We need more new cars. Simple. Not saying old cars, if you look properly after, it cannot run. I'm not saying that. Um, then the president asked me at the end, he said, now, how do we fix and I said to Mr. President, these were my words. I said, Mr. President, we urgently need four to 6,000 megawatts of capacity. The day before yesterday, 
if we don't get it, we're going to have difficult days coming. This was three and a half years ago. Now, how many new cars have we put? So, to answer your question, I had to give you this. Eskom has its own problems, and they will they work hard at it. Um, but what we also need to understand, these old cars, these old power stations that's 44 years old on average, are coming to end of life in time to come. That means additional capacity is not going to be available. And everybody's saying that renewables are renewables. Now, when does the sun shine and when does the wind blow? It's always on the time you don't need it. So we need a hybrid solution of capacity. So in time to come, we're going to need more of them. Now, it doesn't help if people are saying, Eskom, you've got 46 or 48,000 megawatts of installed capacity. Just sort yourself out. And there's more than enough. Life doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So to answer your question, I had to give you this back. Up until we have un fully understand the fact that we need additional capacity in this country, a hybrid solution, not only sun and, and, and wind, we are going to have challenges. So my understanding and my view is very clear that we need this additional capacity in the country as soon as possible. And we need to work together as a team in South Africa, SA Inc., to bring this about. And I believe up until we have taken this extremely seriously, we may be setting the challenge. Okay. But you haven't really answered the question. And the question is, how long from where we are today are we still going to be having load shedding for? How long is our economy still going to have this anchor to growth? It's difficult, Alec, to say it's going to be six months, 12 months, 18 months. Um, Eskom will continue to have significant challenges with their coal fleet because the demand is higher than what is available. And what is available, you're running in the red the whole time. It remains unpredictable, it remains unreliable. Up until you have additional capacity that you can take this off and fix it properly, you're going to have these challenges. There is a positive coming that at Kusile, the new power station, you know, that catastrophic failure Eskom had on units one, two, and three. Um, I believe those three units will be back online. That's about 2,100 megawatts before the end of the year. So that's two stages of load shedding. Then the fire that uh, we had or they had in, in unit number five that's in the process to be commercialized, Another 700 plus megawatts, that will also be online before the end of the year, 2,800. So that is a close two or three stages of load shedding. And then what we find is three years ago, ESCO made a decision to start actively but in focus, to focus on, 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 on maintenance on, on the units. Now, slowly but surely, I can see there is a positive contribution and performance on that investment, and that needs to continue. Now, come back to your question. This is about three to four stages of load shedding, and that's where we find ourselves. What we also see is the rooftop solar currently is assisting quite a lot. So I believe maybe, maybe towards the end of next year, middle end of next year, you know, things will, will turn out much better. Interesting, because the ANC, I think, are backing on Making at the beginning of next year, but but uh, thank you, Jan, for that that insight. Last question from me, and then we're going to the audience. We have in the audience the Shadow Minister of Minerals and Energy. So, if the pact wins the next election, James Lorimer has as good a chance as any of being the next minister of that portfolio. Mm. What would your advice? to James right now be? Make sure you spend time on understanding the crystal ball. And the crystal ball is very simple if you think about it. 
One of the major shortcomings in my mind, in my view currently, is that we have an integrated resource plan that is actually meaningless. We need to understand very clearly over a period of 50 years what the demand is going to be. You know, currently, what the demand is, how, what it's, how is it going to change in the next year, three years, five years, ten years, etc.? Then you need to understand what the impact will be of technology innovations. You need to understand, and people are not listening to what I'm saying, you need to understand what the impact of climate change is going to be. You need to sit with the customers to understand how their manufacturing you know, processes will, will change so that you have a very good understanding on what the demand of the country is going to be moving forward. And you need to measure it continuously and you need to adapt. And if you have a very good picture of that, and I know, you know, it's only going to be sort of really clear the first couple of years, and it will get sort of gray, you know, moving forward, but it doesn't matter. As long as you always concentrate on what this demand uh, is going to be. And then, Alec, what is important is to understand what do you have. And what is going to change in this mix that you have? And only if you understand these two will you understand what is required to meet what you need in the future. And this is why I'm saying the current IRP is saying, Eskim, you have 47,000. The country only needs 34. Just sort yourself out. Not understanding what we have got significant challenges. And it's going to change in time to come very quickly. And this is why I find it also very strange that people are saying, what we need is renewables. Not understanding, it's not only renewables, it is a hybrid solution. Hybrid meaning, yes, wind, yes, solar, yes, uh, uh, hydro, nuclear, gas, hydrogen. So you need to understand what, what you need in terms of satisfying your demand. So that's the advice I will be giving. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him about that. Let's Good. see how he responds. But... Uh Thanks, Jan, for, for sharing those insights.